Okay, I'm going to do a message today on why can't lost people understand the Bible. You, know, you talk to lost people sometimes, it's like you're speaking another language uh, when you start to talk about the Bible and subjects relating to the Bible. And there's a very specific reason for that. And uh, lost people will try to uh, read the Bible and they'll say it contradicts and this and that and they find errors with it and things. And you can look at it as a Christian, a saved Christian, you go, well, that's not a contradiction that this lines up with that or that, you know, whatever. But is there a reason why they can't understand the Bible? Yes, there is. We're going to look at that today. You can start out by going to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. I'm going to read down through verse 10. And um, uh, make sure you have a King James Bible because uh, that's another key to it. You need to actually have God's Word before you can talk about this subject. If you have one of the new versions from the Vatican, you don't have God's Word. Ephesians chapter 2. Actually, I think we'll stop at verse 7, actually, because we're going to be reading 8 through 10 later. But uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's very important. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. You're going to see all throughout the Pauline epistles, there's a very distinct uh, difference there between saved and lost. Okay, And we're seeing a big one right here. What's going on there? Verse 1, who were dead in trespasses and sins. And God quickens us when we get saved. Now I have here two remote controls. Okay, They both work on that camera right there. I have JVC cameras. This is one for a newer JVC camera. This is one for the older type like this. But they both work. Okay? But here's the thing. That one's not working, is it? Let's try that one. If I point it in the right direction. Now why is it that this one here does not work and this one works? You know why? Because that little door right there is in and there's a battery in it. This one here, I checked the battery, it's dead. It's got a dead battery. So this thing, it doesn't matter how many times you push that button toward or away, you know, zoom in, zoom out. I can push start, stop, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's got a dead battery. This is a picture of a lost person. A lost person has the capabilities to understand and have a relationship with God, but the Holy Spirit, their spirit is dead. The Holy Spirit has not come into their, their life. They're dead in trespasses and sins. They're like a remote control without a battery. I've said that in other sermons and things, but it really illustrates the point. Until you get saved, you aren't going to understand the book. You cannot understand a spiritual book. This is not just a book of literature. This is not just a work of, of prose or something like this. No, no. This is a living book written by a living Savior. All right? And it, I heard an old statement. I've said this in other sermons, but I'll repeat it one more time. It bears repeating. And that is, the King James Bible is the only book whose author is present every time you read it. Yeah. No other book can say that. This is an amazing book, this King James Bible, the world's best-selling book in all of history. I mean, how many books do you know of that are 400 years old and still applicable to our modern-day world and uh, still very popular? Still wars being fought over this book. This book is still banned in other countries. You know, a lot of people hate this book. It's an amazing book. Even the most wicked atheist out there has to admit that, yes, 
this is an amazing book. It's not like any other book, this King James Bible. Okay? It's the most copied book, too, by the way. People try to copy it and pervert it and change it and update it and whatever else, but they can't. Nobody can replace that book. But let's go next to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'll show you another very important scripture here in, in relation to this thing of why can't lost people understand the book. First of all, we saw that they're dead in trespasses and sins. And by the way, I said there, uh, there in Ephesians chapter 2, talking about the thing of we're seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now. Uh, when you get saved, you're actually connected to the body of Christ, His actual physical body in heaven. So that's why sometimes you'll ha feel kind of down. I'm feeling very down right now. I'm actually very sick uh, trying to get through this study. But you'll feel kind of like, uh, you know, sometimes. And, and there's really no explanation for it. Well, it's because we're feeling what our Heavenly Father feels. That's what we're feeling. God looks down at this world and He says, It grieves me at my heart. I've re I'm repented that I made man sometimes, just like back in the days of Noah. You know, and we are, you're going to feel that sometimes. And you, there's really not going to be much of an explanation for it. You know, I feel just really, really sick and very tired and whatever else. And I don't really know what's going on. It's a spiritual, some kind of spiritual thing going on. I have no idea. Uh, we felt... Uh, really good the last day or two, you know, just filled with joy. And then it's just like you just go back down again. You're going to feel some of that. Why? I'm connected to a living Savior. How do you know Jesus Christ is real? How do you know you haven't believed some kind of cultic thing? Uh, because I know what's real, okay? I can feel it, right? And I have a book, you see? I have it in writing. What do you have? Oh, we have traditions and things like this, traditions of the church. We have uh, traditions of the elders and things like this. Is it living? No. It's dead. But we'll continue on here. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 through 16. And you're going to see, by the way, by the end of this study, um, why we can speak with such confidence as Bible-believing Christians. Okay. You're going to see. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. In other words, heaven is not going to be this down here up there. It's going to be totally different. And by the way, when you get to heaven, it's going to be about Jesus Christ. It's not going to be about you. All right, Jesus is not building some kind of a special little log cabin back at a nice bass pond back in the wilderness or something for you. It's going to be about him. He's going to give us mansions up there, but we're going to be worshiping Him. Heaven is about, you know, bringing praise and glory to Jesus Christ. But let's continue. Verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Hmm. We don't have the same system, the cultic type of a thing like Islam, where you got to go to certain cities and you got to do this and do that, and you got to be go to the Catholic Church, and you got to go to Vatican, and you got to go to the special cathedral and all this other stuff. We don't have that. What God can give you, freely given to you, the wisdom and truth that He can give you, you can have it right there, right uh, wherever you're at watching this. You can shut this video off and go pray to the Lord, read His Word, if you're saved, and He'll give it to you freely. It's amazing. Verse, thing, verse 13, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Very important. Okay, notice there, uh, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. You're not going to see much in the way of man's wisdom at this ministry here. I don't put on shows for people, okay? Um, <laughs> this is not a high-dollar production. I could do that stuff, but uh, I don't want to because I don't want people to worship me. I want people to understand that this is their standard. And I've said that for years and years and years now, and I'm not going to quit saying it. 
It's about the book. It's not about me. Okay? Very important there. But the other thing that's important is, which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Okay? A Bible-believing Christian, the thing that sets us apart from all other forms, fundamentalists and uh, evangelicals, Protestants, Catholics, whatever, the thing that sets us apart is we compare spiritual things with things spiritual. Check it out with the Scriptures. Does this line up with that? Does that line up with that? Rightly divide the word of truth, too. You're not going to get too far as a Bible-believing Christian if you are non-dispensational. You're going to make a mess of the Bible. Okay, you have to learn to rightly divide the word of truth. I have studies on that. You can look those up. But you compare spiritual things with spiritual. That's very important. But look at verse 14 here. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. He cannot know them. Notice it says that. Neither can he know them. So you can't, you can't explain vital Bible doctrines to an atheist. You know, these atheists, they're, I'm more and more I'm convinced, you know, talking to Brother Eric John Phelps, and he said that atheists are essentially humanistic uh, Luciferians. Exactly it. Uh, they worship themselves. They worship, you know, they, they go back to the Garden of Eden thing with uh, ye can be as gods and all that. We'll be looking at that later. Um, but that's what they do. They believe that they can set their standards for good and evil in their lives. They're Luciferians. Uh, they rebel against God is what they are. But you see, they'll come out and they'll say, well, I can understand the Bible intellectually. I can just look at this book and understand it intellectually. And ha ha, it doesn't make sense to me. See what they're trying to do? They're trying to uh, control the camera with a dead remote control. You see? And when it doesn't work, they say, I guess the camera's broken. Uh, no, you don't have batteries in your remote control. You're dead in trespasses and sins, according to the book. And God isn't going to reveal anything to any atheist that's there in their pride. You have to have that pride broken and come to God as a repentant, contrite sinner. Repentant, meaning that you're willing to turn towards God. Turn from your self-righteousness. Turn from your life of sin and say, Okay, God, when you save me, you tell me what to do. I'll live for you. I will live a new life for you, all right, after salvation. It's important to get. Contrite. What is contrite? Understanding my sins are wrong. I've done bad things. I've sinned against God. I want to make restitution for that. You see? Broken, repentant, contrite spirit. You come to God that way, then He'll start to show you things about the Bible. Till then, nope. God resisteth the proud but giveth grace to the humble. But let's continue. Verse 15, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Why do we have the mind of Christ as saved Christians? Because we've been saved. We're born again. We're new creatures in Christ Jesus. Important to remember. Go next to John chapter 14. And you know, again, I've said this before, I'm just going to repeat it because there's a lot of new people that come along. They don't watch the older videos right away. But uh, another thing is, I'm not going to be putting up a lot of scriptures on the screen for you because I want you to actually get the King James Bible in your own hands and you can get them pretty easily. You know, there's ones that are of poorer quality and things, but you're going to still get, you know, the, the vital doctrines of it. There's differences in some of the editions that, you know, because, see, there's no copyright on the King James, so people can print it and, and change some of the spelling and things like that. You know, you should stick with more of the Cambridge type, That's, but it's more of about a, a, some of the spelling changes and things like that. Uh, you're still going to be able to come out with the truth, uh, even the ones where they change some of the spelling, whatever. You can go to a dollar store, in other words, to get a cheap one. But the point is, I want people to read the Bible for themselves. Compare spiritual things with things spiritual. Check out what I'm saying. Make sure I'm reading the verses correctly. All right, that's very important. But I want to show you something here very interesting. John chapter 14, verse 15. 
It says here, If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world, look at this, cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. Hmm. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. All right? This is before Jesus dies on the cross, so he's telling them what's going to be coming in the future. The Holy Spirit comes upon them, and now they understand the truth. The Holy Spirit comes upon you when you get saved. You don't have to worry about, you know, these charismaniacs, they'll sing, you know, Come, Holy Spirit, come into our meeting, Holy Spirit. Uh, well, you ought to get saved. Then you wouldn't have to try to look for him. He'd be there already. And a lot of these charismaniac devils also, they teach this thing of, you know, well, you get saved and then you've got to seek the Holy Spirit. That's a problem. Because what Jesus is saying right there, he sends the comforter. He's not saying this is after salvation, so you get saved, you get born again, and then later on the comforter comes. No, 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 no. What he's saying is right now he hasn't died on the cross yet. It's still somewhat of a mystery. So when he dies on the cross, then when salvation comes, the Holy Spirit comes right then. But let's continue. Verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Yet a, little, yet a little while in the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am, uh, I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will mani manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, another, the other Judas there, uh, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Now look at this, verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which he hears not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, now look at this, how he defines it, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I, I have said unto you. Okay, so again, we're seeing this thing being reinforced over and over again here in Scripture. When you get saved, God sends the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, whatever you want to say there. You, God sends the Holy Ghost into your life and you are quickened now you're able to understand this book. And before you do that, before your pride is broken, before your self-righteousness is broken, God's not going to reveal anything to you about this book. The only thing that God will reveal to a, a sinner is the fact that they're a sinner. Again, that's why the world hates this book so bad, because they know that this book condemns them. And it does. This book says that they're going to go to a place called hell, and they're going to burn eternally, weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth in pitch black darkness because of their sin and the fact that they've rejected Jesus Christ. Hmm. That's why they hate the book. And that's why they try to intellectually approach this book and try to figure things out and stuff like that. You can't. Until you're born again, you cannot understand this book. It's not possible. Okay, another place to go to here, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm going to show you there's another key to understanding this book that happens uh, when you're saved. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. It says here, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Hmm. Now there's another very, very important principle there. You see, the Holy Spirit can come in, will come into you at salvation, not can come, will come into you at salvation, and he will teach you what this book says, but this book will seem foreign to the life of a carnal Christian. It won't seem to make sense. It won't really, there won't be much life application going on. You won't be able to read it and go, yeah, I can relate to that. I'm going through that. It won't happen that way. Why?
because the carnal Christian does not really believe what they're reading. You see, another part of understanding this book and, and living according to the scriptures is, what's your attitude towards it? Do you approach this book with a critical eye? Do you approach this book and say, well, it's just a translation. It's not really God's inspired word. It's this, it's that, you know. Or do you approach this book and say, I believe this book is from God. I believe this King James Bible is God's word for the English-speaking people of today. And whatever the equivalent is of this King James Bible in other foreign languages. Do you believe that God has preserved his word? You say, well, I, no, I don't really. Okay, it's not going to work. You might be able to understand some things. But it's not going to work in your life until you start to believe it. You know, a lot of these guys, I'm convinced of this as time goes by. I've seen a lot of these guys that are, that are Bible-believing Christians and whatever else, but they, they start doing things that are contrary to the Word of God, and God just goes, okay, you're on the shelf. I've seen that thing. You get some of these guys that are, that are stuck in these church buildings and things like that, and they know. They know. I've seen it. They, they'll say, well, yeah, there's no church buildings in the New Testament. Then why are you doing it? Then why? Well, you know, it's, well, it's, you know, and they'll come up with these excuses and things like that. You know what happens with a lot of them? God sticks them on the shelf. All they do is they go over and they, they preach the same sermons, you know. They have uh, 30 different sermons and they preach them wherever they go. God doesn't show them a whole lot of new things. Why? Because they stop believing certain parts of the Bible. Certain things in the Bible that are, they're kind of ashamed of. You know, you need to have that credibility of, of, I have a church building. You know, you don't want to stand inside of a room with just your bookshelf behind you or whatever else. You look kind of foolish. You know, I'd look a lot better now, I guess, if I had a really expensive suit and tie on. You know, clean shaven and all this other stuff. You see? You say, why don't you do those things? Because I don't care. I live by this book. I, my desire in life is to prove to you that this book is real, that this book works. That's my desire. And yeah, it's a lot more difficult sometimes than just to, you know, to live by the Bible than to just go along with the flow. But that's what I'm going to do. So you need to believe God's Word if you expect it to work in your life. Now we're going to go to Exodus 31. What is the Spirit of God? Now, this is a very interesting part. This is the main part of this study. I just, a little other part there was kind of the beginning, the introduction. But I want to talk to you about the Spirit of God. Very interesting. Exodus chapter 31. We'll start here in verse 1, read down to verse 5. It says here, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name... Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. Interesting, Jesus, Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God. Now look at this. There's four things mentioned here. We're going to cover these in detail. In wisdom, and in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship. To devise cunning works, to work in gold, and in silver, and in brass, and in cutting of stones, to set them and in carving of timber to work in all manner of workmanship. All right? So God chooses this young man. All right? But see, notice the things there. The four. Wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and, manner, and all manner of workmanship. All right? When the Holy Spirit comes into your life, He will give you those things. And we're going to look at those in detail. See what each one is. We're going to start out here with wisdom. Where does wisdom come from? Psalm, the book of Psalm. Psalms, Psalm 110. I'm sorry, Psalm 111. I have it written wrong there. Psalm 111, verse 10. Where do you get wisdom? The Bible says here, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. His praise, praise endureth forever. Now, Again, take these intellectual little smarty pants out there, these atheistic fools. And today, actually, as I'm preaching this, it's April 1st. So, happy atheist day to everybody out there that's an atheist. Uh, April Fool's Day. But uh, you take these little intellectual people and they're just like, 
I'm going to understand this book and I can understand anything that you can preach and all this other stuff. Uh, do you fear God? No, I don't even believe in God. And they'll make fun of God. They'll say nasty things about the Lord. Okay, then you don't have any wisdom, any real wisdom. Okay? The Bible says the fool hath said in his heart there is no God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You see, when you come to God as a sinner, part of that whole decision to become born again, to come to, to the Lord in that broken, contrite spirit, is I understand that there is the wages of sin is death. I understand that there's something that's going to happen to me if I don't come to God for salvation. You learn to fear God. And by the way, that fear extends the whole way through your life as a Christian. We're going to look about what this fear is all about. Let's turn back to 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles 13. Now, I might have made this mistake. I didn't, I'm not going to go through all my old sermons and stuff like this, but if I've ever said that the fear of God is kind of a reverential fear like a son would have for their father, uh, that doesn't quite cover it. That does not quite do it. I'm going to show you what real fear of God is all about. 1 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 9 through 14. It says here, And when they came unto the threshing floor of Chidon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him, because he put his hand to the ark, and there he died before God. And David was displeased, because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. Wherefore, that place is called Perez Uzzah uh, to this day. And David was afraid of God that day, saying, How shall I bring the ark of God home to me? So David brought not the ark home to himself to the city of David, but carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house three months. And the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom, and all that he had. Why was David afraid? And a more important question, why did God drop Uzzah? So you look at that thing and you go, what's the big deal? I mean, the ark shifted a little bit and he goes like this and he you know, just catches it. The oxen you know, stumble a little bit and, it, and the ark, you know, he didn't want the ark to fall off on the ground. Yeah, but you see here, by doing that, he was saying, I don't trust God to take care of this ark. And if you notice in verse 8, And David and all Israel played before God with all their might, and with singing, and with harps, and with psalteries, and with timbrels, and with cymbals, and with trumpets. So they're having this big like worship service and things because the ark of God's back there in Israel and things, and it's just like, you know, could it have start, you know, could, could there have been a possibility that it was starting to get a little bit carnal? Maybe some pride entering in there? I don't know. The text really doesn't say. But uh, you have to wonder. But God looks down and he sees that Uzzah and he goes like this and he, he reaches her, grabs her, however he did it, and God just goes, bam, you're dead. See, God knows the thoughts. And sometimes we look at something that happens to somebody and we go, wow, I wonder what happened. You know, it's a terrible death that that person died. You know, why would God allow something like that? Why would God cause the death of somebody like that? Because God knows the secrets there. He knows the thought life. He knows what's going on when we don't. All right. He is a just judge. God will never judge somebody unrighteously. It's not ever going to happen. All right. But you see there, David was afraid of God that day. Why? Because David had some sin in his life. And he was thinking to himself, if God did that to Uzzah, what would he do to me if he found out these secret thoughts up here? Hmm. But uh, Obed-Edom, what did God do when they took the ark into his house? God blessed him. You see, there's a great blessing that comes upon those who fear God. And you can see that all throughout the, the Bible. You'll see that theme repeated over and over again. When you fear God, he'll bless you for it. Remember, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that's why I'm saying lost people, they can't understand the book because they don't fear God. They're, God's not going to show anything to somebody that doesn't fear Him. 
they haven't even found the beginning of wisdom yet. You see? You see, but okay, this is all in the Old Testament. This is back there in the Old Testament. We don't have to do that anymore, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5. What's your motivation as a Christian for serving the Lord? Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Stop there for a minute. Um, Christians are not going to get out without being judged. You know, our righteousness is imputed righteousness. It's Jesus' righteousness that comes to us and He covers all of our sins of our past, present, and future. All right? Oh, then we don't have to be judged. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, everybody goes through judgment. Okay? And we're going to have our works tried at the judgment seat of Christ. There's going to be a lot of people that get up to heaven and they're going to see their entire uh, ministry get burned up. And I've talked about the judgment seat of Christ. Can't go through it here. I have a whole study on it here on uh, YouTube or wherever else this video is playing. I have a whole study on uh, the judgment seat of Christ. But the point is, there's going to be people that were doing things carnally, kind of like Uzzah there, you know, uh, really weren't, wasn't relying on the Lord. And God's going to judge you for that. But what's our real motivation? Check this out. Verse 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Okay? But notice there, it's knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. We persuade men. Do you uh, really stand behind what God is going to be doing to the lost world? You say, well, yeah, sure, you know, the hell and everything like that, if there, there's a reject Jesus. Do you realize what hell is? Pitch black darkness, weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth, burning forever? How could you worship a God like that? See, that's what you're going to get from the lost world. I refuse to believe in this God of yours, this torture master. Oh, uh, is God a torture master? Yes. I can't believe you just said that. Hey, read Matthew chapter 25. Hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. You don't have to go there. He provided a way out. He provided his son. No greater, greater debt could be paid to pay for your sins. Why are you so wicked as to reject that if you're lost? But, you know, we get this put on us all the time, and you're just supposed to feel embarrassed. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't believe this. I, I shouldn't believe that God could torture people in hell for all of eternity. Uh, yes, you should, as a Christian. And that terror, knowing the terror of the Lord, that's why we persuade men. That's what our text says. Now, uh, are you ashamed of that? Are you going to pull a, a David and say, well, I, I just kind of avoid that. I don't really want to talk to people about the reality of hell. I just kind of put that someplace else as, you know. Or do you say, uh, no, you know what? I believe in hell. I believe in the reality of hell. And I'm going to tell people about the reality of hell. I'm going to tell them about the terror of the Lord. Do you fear God enough to do that? Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you're ashamed of this book, God's ashamed of you. Hmm. Next, go to Romans chapter 1. I'll show you what uh, God thinks of the lost world here. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. It says here, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. They don't want to be judged for their sins. Say, I was born this way. I, I have a, you know, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. 
Verse 19, because that which may be made, or what that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. God writes the law in their hearts. Romans chapter 4 talks about that. Or uh, chapter 2, excuse me. Uh, verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And check this out, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. April Fool's Day. Happy Atheist Day, as I said earlier. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. They profess themselves to be wise. It's kind of interesting, too, because who are the most prideful, egotistical people in, on the planet? Professors. They not only are, are messed up in their own mind, they're trying to mess up the young people and destroy their faith in the Bible. I've heard stories, you know, young people go off to these stupid, idiotic universities. I don't know, why would you even go to them? dumb things. You come out with a debt and no promise at all of a, of a job in the field that you have your training for. But, you know, young people go in there and they, and I've heard stories of them, the professors will take a Bible and they'll say, this is what I think of this book. And they go over and they throw it in the trash can. You know what they are? Professing themselves to be wise. They're fools. Mm -hmm. They look at this world and they say all the complexity of nature and they say, oh, it happened by random chance. Mm -hmm. Just like all these books behind me here, this all came from an explosion in an uh, office supply store. The paper and the ink just kind of exploded and, and uh, it all just kind of and turned into books. <laughs> stupid. Stupid. There's no nice way for me to put it. It's stupid. Okay? Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. If you believe that kind of a thing... You know, you're going to believe the same thing. It's, you're basically saying even worse than that by looking at the complexity of nature and saying, random chance, explosion, billions of years ago. You're crazy. Ex an explosion and slowly we got to here. Even though when you have an explosion and it causes the aftermath there, it doesn't get better. It gets worse. That's a law of science. They, let's not be confused by science now, you know. Verse 23, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Yep. Most of these atheists are into perversion. They're sex perverts among other things. And why are they like that? Because they rejected the book. That's why. Next, let's look at the word understanding. Go back to Job chapter 28, verse 28. This is one of the most important verses in your entire Bible. Uh, really, really, really an incredible verse. We saw that the beginning of wisdom comes from what? Fearing God. Now, if you fear the Lord, what are you going to do? Job 28, verse 28. And unto man he said, Behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. We saw that earlier. And to depart from evil is understanding. You want to live a life, a happy life as a Christian? Fear God and depart from evil. When God says, that's wicked, you don't say, well, I don't know. It kind of depends on how you look at it. I mean, maybe just a little bit. So the Lord says, hey, abstain from all appearance of evil. Well, okay, I do watch a little bit of television once in a while. And I, I okay, I do you know, abstain from all appearance of evil. What are you doing? Hey, drunkenness, that's wrong. It's wicked. Well, you know, maybe a little bit once in a while. God is never going to take anything from you that's good for you. Anything that God warns about in His Word, it's all negative things. So when you fear God, you will have the wisdom to say, okay, I'm going to depart from that stuff, and that departing from the evil is understanding. Very simple. 1 Kings chapter 3.
First Kings chapter three, verse five. Let's look at this. The wisest man that ever lived outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5. In Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. Kind of a genie in the bottle type of a deal, you know. I'll give you a wish, whatever you want. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David my father great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee and that and thou hast kept me or thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given uh, him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day and now o lord my god thou hast made thy servant king instead of david thy my father and i am but a little child i know not how to go out or to or come in and thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Now look at this. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this thy so great uh, a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words, lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. Interesting, because there has never been another political ruler on the planet like King Solomon. That's why the Masons worship him. That's why a lot of their rituals are based around things that King Solomon did. There's never been anybody who's been as rich, had as many wives and, and concubines, had as much power, had as much knowledge. Nobody. Jesus Christ was the only one that had more wisdom than he did. But the point is, no other ruler ever in history could equal King Solomon. And what was it that he asked for? understanding hmm and what was tied to that understanding judgment to depart from evil is understanding what he needed to do to be able to depart from evil you need to judge things you need to say that's wicked that's okay that's bad that's good that's what you need to do Turn next to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. This is written by King Solomon. Definitely my favorite book of the whole Bible, the book of Proverbs. A lot of wisdom in there. It says here, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. To give subtlety to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb in the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Hmm. There's the next one, knowledge, that we're going to be looking at next here. I'm going to look at another place here with the thing of understanding. But the point is there, you see all these things are tying together. Why? It's the Spirit of God. God's Spirit, when He comes in, you know when you get the uh, battery that makes the remote work? When God's Spirit comes in, He will give you all those things. But guess what, Christian? A lot of it's up to you. You see, there's an old saying, you can lead a horse to the water, but you can't make him drink. Well, the Holy Spirit can lead you into all these things, but it's up to you. You have a free will. God's Holy Spirit is not going to twist your arm and, and, you know, you will listen to this. He won't do that. See, a lot of sin that comes into the lives of life of a Christian is actually self-correcting. <laughs> all right? Um... You start to watch television, it's going to mess with your mind. 
You start to drink alcohol, you're going to get cirrhosis of the liver. You start to smoke, you're going to get cancer, emphysema. You start to whatever, you see? God's not going to have to punish you for some of that stuff. Now, he will punish you. He will correct you. He will chasten you as a, as a father does, does his son. Certainly, that's there. But uh, a lot of it's just negative. It's bad stuff. So if you want to continue in it, well, you're going to suffer. The best thing that you can do is just sell out completely to the Lord. But let's continue. Turn to the New Testament, 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7. It says here, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Mm -hmm. Do you consider what Paul says? I hope so, because those are your instructions. You're a uh, marching orders as a Christian, so to speak. And by the way, it says there in verse 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You know, when you're a soldier, you get army manuals and, and regulations and things like that. And you know, our, our modern day military, a lot of the regulations aren't any good. A lot of it's just nonsense, bureau, bureaucratic red tape and things. But uh, some of the manuals have some good stuff in them. I have some of them, you know, over here, some of my I bought myself and some of the things were from my wife when she was in the Army and then the Navy. Uh, but some of the manuals have some good information. And that's just written by carnal lost people. But how about this manual? You see? You see, the lost world looks at this book as a, as a uh, stupid old book. It's archaic. It's, it's ridiculous. We ought to get rid of that Bible. These Bible thumping people and all this stuff like that. But if they would actually get saved... And start to live by the pages of this book and understand it. And understand that this book, you know one of the reasons why there's so much bad stuff in this book? Stories of people being killed and, and rape and this and all this other bad stuff. Because God tells the truth about man. That's why. You know why God had all those bloody rules and things back in the Old Testament? Because man is wicked. And God was dealing with a nation, a nation of Israel. And he was saying, hey, go in there and you kill all those people. Why? They're wicked. They're very wicked. See, sex perversion starts out and it gets worse and worse and worse. And it always ends the same way. It ends with defiling children. Always. And that's what's happening in America right now. Another subject. But now let's look at knowledge. Now there's a warning with this one. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. You're going to see here that knowledge can be, this is one of the things that people can have, saved or lost. First Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. But as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. And I believe he's talking to saved people, but knowledge is going to be there for saved and lost. We'll show you that as we continue. Knowledge puffeth up. But charity edifieth. Who do you think you are? I mean, you're talking to me like I'm some kind of lower than you. I have a PhD. I have a THD. I have a THM. I have a DD. I have a... What is that? Knowledge puffeth up. You see? Interesting. Verse 2. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. I love that. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Do you love God? I don't believe God exists. <laughs> okay, puffed up, egotistical, you know, fool. That's what these people are. We're going to see where you got your knowledge from. Turn way back to the beginning. Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to demonstrate to you that uh, you can have knowledge without it being connected to the Lord. Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says here, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Hmm. Verses 16 and 17 of the same chapter says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, 
For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Hmm. Very interesting there. God gives us wisdom. He gives us truth freely. It says back there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Here it says you can eat of the, these different trees freely. But when you eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then you die. Hmm. Now let's see what the tie-in is, is here. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Now the serpent was more subtle than, than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, questions God, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. See? He questions God. Verse 2. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it lest ye die. God didn't say that. She added to God's word. But look at what Satan says to her. That's who it's talking about here in the context. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. He's denying what God says. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Hmm. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. See how it all ties together? She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Interesting because the masons, high level masons, wear aprons, little lambskin aprons. Very interesting. A lot of things I could say there, but we're not going to go off on that. But the point is, the eyes of them both were opened. You know what they call that today? Enlightenment. Isn't that funny? I have transcended your ideas of sin. What are you? I'm enlightened. <laughs> yes, you certainly are. Your eyes have been opened. You're a Satanist, a Luciferian, a devil worshiper. These people out there, these these Luciferian atheists. That's what they are. They think that they know good and evil. In reality, their goose is cooked. They're going to be going to hell. You see, you can have knowledge. There's nothing wrong with knowledge. There's good things in, in the Bible that talk about knowledge. There's no problem there. But the point is, knowledge is something that's just... I mean, all, all, a lot of this stuff here is knowledge. Okay, a lot of these books, you know, I, I have books that saved and lost people. All right, I'd like to study a lot of different things. I have a lot of this is just for documentation and whatever else. I don't say that everything here is absolute truth. Certainly not. But these people, a lot of them have knowledge. But they don't have the wisdom that comes from first fearing God and they don't have understanding that comes from departing from evil. They don't have those. So what does their knowledge do for them? Sends them to hell. Hmm. But now we're going to go back and focus on the Christians again. What about workmanship? Turn back to your New Testament to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Where we left off earlier, we stopped at verse 7. It says here, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Hmm, ordained that we should walk in them. And of course, some devil-worshipping, little easy believism heretic will say, well, it says should. It doesn't say we have to. Oh, please, come on. Don't listen to these people. You know, The changed life gospel is bad. Don't listen. They're false. They're false prophets. They're false whatever. They're liars. Okay? Right there, you're seeing it. Okay? God did not say here, the Bible does not say, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works before our salvation. No, 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 no. Good works come as proof of salvation. That's going to be there. And we've talked about that in plenty of studies. Go from here to Revelation chapter 4. Verse 
Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Again, another very important verse. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Let me ask you a question, Christian. Is your life bringing pleasure to God? Is He pleased with your actions? Do you fear Him? Well, I respect Him. I didn't ask you if you respect Him. I said, do you fear Him? Do you see things that God does in this world and you go, wow. Let me give you a couple examples. What about uh, World War II? You know there was a lot of Jews that died in that war? In those death camps? But you know what else? There were a lot of Germans in Dresden that the uh, Allied forces firebombed. Why didn't that come up at the Nuremberg trials? Why didn't it come up in the Nuremberg trials that the United States also firebombed Tokyo? Dropping incendiary bombs down and burning civilians, including little children? Huh. Even though that was illegal, it was a war crime. But you see, the Allies won the war, so they weren't prosecuted. And I'm not saying, I'm not defending the Nazis. Believe you me. But they weren't attacking the Nazis, they were attacking the German people when they firebombed Dresden. They weren't attacking the Japanese fascist forces, they were attacking the people. Why? Why were little children burned to death? Old men, old women, why were they burned? You know why? Because the God of this book said, I have plans for the nation of Israel. And I'm going to bring the nation, that, those Jewish people, back to their land. Looks down at the earth and he says, oh, a couple million people are going to have to die to set my plans in motion. Okay. What are you going to do with that? So, well, I, I don't know. I just can't. Are you going to move the ark of God to somebody else's house? Are you going to reject that part of God? Are you going to say, I don't want to think about that aspect of my God? Are you going to do that? Natural disasters and things like this, little children dying, old women, old pe people that are quote-unquote innocent dying. Are you ashamed of God? Or do you really truly fear Him? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Hmm. And then uh, it goes, and to depart from evil is understanding. How much evil are you willing to depart from? Or uh, are there some things that you're just going to kind of cling to yourself and say, no, no. And God says, hey, what do you got in your hands there? Don't you take it from me. It's not that bad. God says it's bad. I don't want you to have that in your life. Would you give that up for me? No. You see? You see? I'm not going to save people here. You know, I know some miserable little reprobates are going to be writing in the comments, oh, he's making more conditions for salvation. Oh, shut up. You know, go do something else. Good night. Wear me out. You know, people. <laughs> I mean, I'm talking to save people. If you're saved, if you've come to the Lord, you're born again, I'm trying to get you to get that relationship with the Lord fine-tuned, all right? More powerful, more sanctified as time goes by. Your relationship to the Lord should get better as time goes by. Not become stagnant, not get worse. It should get better. That's what we're talking about here. How much knowledge do you have for the Lord? Is your life bringing pleasure to God? That's the question here. Because if it isn't, you can do something about it today. You don't have to say, well, I've messed up. I guess God's never going to use me. I'm just no good. I guess I just, I'll never mess. Get it confessed. Forsake it. Move forward. I have messed up so many times in my life, I can't even tell you how many times. And you know what? You have to just say, oh, I'm sorry about that, Lord. I can't believe I did that thing. And you move forward. Confess it. Forsake it. Move forward. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 
couple more places to turn to here. 1 Corinthians 12. Start at verse 1. This thing of the uh, skill or the workmanship. When God's Holy Spirit comes upon you, there's workmanship there. It's one of the aspects of what He'll do with your life. Let's look about this. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You're supposed to know about spiritual gifts, brethren. You're supposed to know what is the workmanship. We are His workmanship, created unto good works. We're supposed to know about these. Verse 2. Ye know that ye were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore I give you to understand... Understanding? That no man speaketh, speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but, but, but by the Holy Ghost. i got to say Jesus is the Lord, because these charismaniacs will come out and they'll say, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. It's <laughs> not what the text says. Jesus is the Lord. Definitive article. Okay, the in front of a singular word, Lord. So it's the Lord. Very important to understand that. And, you know, no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. People that go to hell are accursed. So somebody that comes out and says that Jesus had to burn in hell to pay for your sins, his death on the cross didn't quite cut it, and his shed blood, no, that doesn't do it. He had to burn in hell for three days. Uh, that's not being spoken by the Spirit of God. Stephen Anderson, if you don't know who I'm talking about, and other little devils out there. Kenneth Copeland also teaches the same thing. Joyce Meyer, a bunch of them. I think Benny Hinn has even said about that. But look at verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are diversities of administration, or differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. See it there? Fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom. To another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. Hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. Did you know that there's more than one gift for us today? See, if you have divine healing, you just go over to people, oh, that guy has an arm cut off. Okay, be healed. Boom. Boom arm comes back. And that's what Jesus was doing too, by the way. But you go over to another person, oh, they got a fever, boom, be healed. Well, this person here, they have uh, whatever, blood, high blood pressure or a woman that has an issue of blood or whatever, boom, be healed. See? You only need one gift of healing when it's supernatural like that, when it's a miraculous, instantaneous, boom, gift of healing. But you see, the Bible just said there, right here in verse 9, the gifts, plural, of healing. There's an S there behind gift. Gifts of healing. There's nutritional you know, therapy. That's a healing art. What's somebody eating? You can tell somebody how to get their diet fixed up so that they are going to be healed of some of their diseases. There's uh, medicinal types of things as far as herbs and, and vitamins, minerals, things like that. Those are gifts of healing. And I do believe that there's also a gift of healing there in terms of of uh, emergency, like somebody breaks their arm, you help them with that or whatever else. Gifts of healing. Interesting. Verse 10, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. People say, do you believe in tongues for today? Absolutely. Oh yes, absolutely. I believe in English, German, Spanish, French, Italian, Say, oh no 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 no! I meant I meant uh, like the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues type of a thing. Of uh, that's not in the Bible, okay? This hashtla shantai antai botai, this all the stuff that the Charismatics do. Mm -mm. No, you're not going to find that in your Bible, right? The Book of Acts, it's always a known language. Look at Acts chapter two. By the time you get here to the First Corinthians twelve through fourteen. You have to have interpretation of those tongues. Why? Because there are people there that don't understand it. But they're always known languages. You say, what about unknown tongues? That's why there's an interpreter. <laughs> you look at the book of Acts, there's no interpreters. Why? They're known languages. 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, you need an interpreter. Why? It's an unknown tongue. Nobody understands that specific tongue. All right? Again, I have a whole study on that. 
Verse 11, But all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. We are one. You know, we're not uh, uh, churches, multiple churches that scattered throughout. You know, churches are just called out assemblies, but we're all one body. All right, understand that. But you see there the thing of workmanship. Can you find something in that passage there, verses 1 through 13, that relates to your life? You say, well, I, I don't really see anything in there. Is it because you have not had the fear of the Lord really strongly manifest in your life and because you're not departing from evil? Because you see there, you go back there in our text to, uh, what was it, Exodus 31. Wisdom, understanding come before knowledge and workmanship. So it's the path to sanctification. You start out, you say, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's how you get started. You fear God. The amazing grace, you know, goes, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and uh, grace my fears relieved." All right, but you start out with fear. You fear God, and you say, "I need to get saved." The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. To depart from evil is understanding. Knowledge comes next. And then workmanship. So if you were saying, well, I don't really see many spiritual gifts in my life, maybe it's because you don't have the first three worked out. Work on those. One more place to go here. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1, verses 9 through 12. Now notice we're going to see all of the four things there in this passage. Colossians 1, verse 9 says, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, workmanship, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Very important verses. And to conclude this study, uh, you know, this, this thing of lost people, um, you cannot expect them to understand this book. And you know what? When people try to draw you into debates about uh, why does the Bible say this or why does the Bible say that, you're really just wasting your time when you try to debate things from the Scriptures. Uh, I'll, I'll grant you there are times that you'll hear somebody and they say, well, you know, I, I got saved because I heard of such and such thing or whatever else. But uh, you've got to be real careful of that as a Christian. Uh, the lost world is going to try to get you to back off on your stands for the truth. They're going to try to uh, shut you up. You know, the Holy Spirit of God within you trying to speak to them and convict them of sin. They're going to try to get you away from that. And uh, the fact of the matter is they're not going to understand this book until they get saved. That's the way God has it worked out. Uh, they're not going to turn anything on when they have a dead battery. Know what I mean? But I just want to tell you, uh, things are going to get a lot rougher uh, as time goes by in some ways. I'll say more about that in a minute. But, uh, you know, I've never taught that uh, the rapture is just a, you know, we sit on a satin pillow and we just eventually get caught up to be with the Lord and we never have to suffer anything. If you're saved, you're going to suffer. And if you're saved, you have suffered at the hands of lost people. Many times your own family members, own relatives. And uh, you're going to get kicked around like that. And what they want from you is they want you to stop being so dogmatic. They want you to be stop stop being so judgmental. You know why? Because they don't like the standard that God gave to man. That's why lost people can't understand the book. That's why. 
because they haven't taken step one. They haven't come to the Lord and said, I fear you. I understand what you've done to people throughout history, and I know it's just by your grace that I'm even breathing right now. I mean, I understand something. You know, this becomes more and more apparent to me as time goes by. We are literally walking around with people that in a few years from now are going to be taking the mark of the beast and getting God's pure 100% wrath. You know, you can be the most tattooed, pierced, fornicating, devil-worshipping, drug-addicted, whatever, today and get saved. God will save anybody today. But in that time of Jacob's trouble, those people will take the mark of the beast, the most clean-cut, morally upright, whatevers, if they take the mark of the beast, they get God's wrath, according to Revelation 14, verses 9 through 11. And you, brother and sister, you're walking around this world right now where you go out shopping, you go out and whatever else, maybe even when you get together with family, you are literally rubbing shoulders, so to speak, with those people. Interesting. We are literally seeing the generation that's going to be there for that mark of the beast. Absolutely beyond any doubt. The nation of Israel is back in their land. Things are, the stage is being set for this time. The rapture is going to happen. And you know what? Excuse me. You know what? My motivation, as this time gets closer and closer, my motivation is I know the terror of the Lord that's coming. And these stinking, disgusting posties, it's so, it's so, ugh, it's bad. They'll, they'll come out and they'll say, hey, actually, you know, the events of Revelation aren't going to be as bad as you'd think. <laughs> I'm going, what? <laughs> you know, a third of the people dying? I mean, that's just one of the judgments. One third of the people dying. A third of the trees burning up. All green grass burned up. That's not going to be that bad? God's wrath is coming. And there's going to be a lot of people that we thought were quote-unquote innocent. There's going to be a lot of oozes out there. A lot of people that are in church buildings right now. And they're good people. They're very nice people. You have a flat tire, they'll pull over. They'll help you with that flat tire. They'll, they'll help you with your groceries. They'll, they'll do whatever. They'll, they'll, they'll give you the shirt off their back. And you know what? In a few years, they're going to be taking the mark of the beast and going to be getting God's wrath poured out on them. Why? They're not genuinely saved. They're not truly saved. They're doing the little religion thing. And that's why when you start to talk to them about the book, you start to bring up truth from the book, they'll get angry at you. And they'll treat you just like a lost person would treat you. Professing Christians. You've seen it. I know you have. I get letters all the time. Emails and letters in the mail and private messages and whatever else. All the time. Relatives turning against you and things like this, calling you crazy and whatever else. And they're professing Christians that are doing this. You know, turning against you as Bible-believing Christians. The lost world is never going to be able to understand this book, brethren. We cannot pretty this book up. We cannot make this book fashionable, updated for our modern world. This book is offensive. But you know what? We have promises in this book of what our God is going to be doing to this lost world. And I'm going to tell you something. If you're lost and you're watching this, I love you more than anybody else out there in this world that's lost and telling you that you're okay. Bible-believing Christians like myself, we love you. That's why we tell you about hell. That's why we tell you about the horrors and things of the time of Jacob's trouble that's coming rapidly. The worst time period on earth where God is supernaturally going to shorten the days so some people can be saved. In other words, make it through alive. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's going to be so bad. You talk about nightmare. The Bible says in Revelation 6, 4 that peace is taken from the earth. The animals turning against people. Natural disasters. The, all the water in the world turning into blood. And I'm warning you. And for you Christians out there, don't be ashamed of the book. Stand by the Word of God. And it isn't going to get any better either. you know. <laughs> and when I say it's not going to get any better, I'm not trying to discourage you. Because you see... There's one aspect of being a Bible-believing Christian. 
when you start to believe this book and you say, I fear God, that's the beginning of wisdom. I'm going to depart from evil. That's understanding. And I can have knowledge. I can read this book and I can see this book and I can see the applications out there in the world. I say, ooh, knowledge. And I know what God wants me to do with my talents that he's given me. So I have workmanship also. And you combine the four. You know what? The threatenings of the lost world aren't going to, they aren't going to bother you anymore. Because you know you're right. They come along and say, you think you're right and everybody else is wrong? Well, in terms of salvation, yes, I do. Yes, I do. I have a standard, and I'll live by the standard. So actually, uh, for me, and for other Bible-believing Christians like us, uh, actually things are getting better. Because as the longer we're here, the more true this book is becoming. I mean, truth is truth. You understand what I'm saying. You're going to be able to see this thing coming to pass. You're lost. You better get saved. You better do it soon. Very soon. You say, well, I think I'm going to wait to see some of this stuff happen. If you're too big of a coward to get saved right now in the privacy of your home or wherever you're watching this video, if you're too big of a coward to do it right now, what makes you think that you're going to be able to do it in a time where you're going to get your head cut off for doing it? Where you're going to become an enemy of the world government? You're not going to be able to buy or sell. What makes you think that you're going to be able to do it then when you can't do it right now? You better get saved. That is going to be it. And, uh, I'm not going to close with a word of prayer this time because I'm just uh, really, really feeling sick right now. <laughs> apologize. Uh, but uh, please keep us in your prayers. Thank you to everybody who's been donating, keeping the ministry going. Uh, really means a lot to us. And uh, really, really, really keep us in your prayers because, boy, the attacks sometimes get real rough. <laughs> so we really do need your prayers. Um, that is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching, and we will see you in the next video.